This week we're talking about suffering. No, I'm joking. <laughs> I'm joking. I know we already had, uh, for those of you who haven't been here, uh, we were doing like three weeks of suffering and last week was lament. Uh, I would do a pop quiz, but I don't feel like doing that. Uh, what's lament? Oh. All right. A lament is a prayer of pain that leads to trust. So if you guys don't know what lamenting is or how to pour out your heart, your emotions to Yahweh, then we, then you guys could just go back on our YouTube and just check it out. It's very good. But we're not going over suffering. We're kind of in the middle of a series right now. So we might be doing some word study or name study, uh, little sermons where we go over a name or the word in the Bible that has significant importance to us. Today we are going over Yahweh. Now normally I'll let you guys sit down, but this is the most quoted passage in all of the scripture. So we're all going to stand up for the reading of, and it's quick, two verses today. So everybody could just uh, stand up real quick. We're going to go over Exodus 34, 6 through 7 today for our name study on Yahweh. And if you guys have it in your Bibles on your phone or whatever, you guys could just follow along or I'll just read it out to you. Then Yahweh passed by in front of him and proclaimed, Yahweh, Yahweh God, compassionate and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in faithfulness and steadfast love, who keeps faithfulness for thousands, who forgives wrongdoing, violation of his law and sin, yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished, inflicting the punishment of the fathers on the children and on the grandchildren to the third and fourth generation. That is the word of our Lord. You guys may be seated. Now, you guys might be wondering, hey, we're reading this, and I don't see Yahweh in my scripture. I see the Lord, the Lord God, in all caps. We're going to get to that. We're going to get to why that's there but be rest assured in the hebrew it is yahweh yahweh elohim or yahweh adonai which is yahweh god now why are names important so i just put up here a little map of ancient israel um, with moab the desert this is kind of where you know moses is leading them out this was written while he was on mount sinai and he was listening to Yahweh right when he was getting the Ten Commandments redone. Now, why are names important? Let's get to that first. In the ancient Near East, where all the Old Testament is taking place, your name signifies your identity and your calling. Your identity and calling. So, for example, we have Malik. Sorry, I'm like, you're my guinea pig today. But his name, if you look at what his name means, it means King Hammer, Malik Malik, King Hammer. Now, you might be like, well, he's not a king, you know, or, you know, he doesn't look much like a hammer. But if you know anything of how the spirit moves in that man's life, you will know he's seated with the king and the spirit hammers truth through him. So in some way, shape or form, his name reflects his identity and calling. My name is Mark Lemieux. My first name, Mark, is a short term of a Latin phrase, which is short of Marcus, which means war. My last name is French, which means the best. So I'm the best at war. Now, that's, that's funny because you're like, oh, you're not, you're not a soldier and there's no stolen valor here. But if anybody knows me, I'm a fighter. I love to fight. I love to win. And done in the right context with Yahweh's help, I am fighting a spiritual war and a spiritual battle to win souls for him. Now, all that to say is that all throughout scripture, we have Abram who went to Abraham. If anybody remember in Genesis, Abram was father, Abraham, father of many nations. And we're going to get to him. He's really big in a narrative part today. But his name had identity and calling. Every person's name in the Old Testament had identity and calling. So it's kind of important when Yahweh is saying, I'm going to tell you my name. Also, names are relational context and intimacy. It would be very weird if Austin always called Noah wife. Wife, wife, right? If he said, oh, my wife. Uh, yes, there is times where that's deeply romantic and beautiful. But if you did it all the time, 
You're like, where's the intimacy? That seems kind of... Or if I call Janae, friend, friend. I, or sister, sister. No, there's, there should be some personal intimacy with that. And we lose that sometimes by just saying God or Lord. It's not necessarily bad, but doesn't it seem like it lacks a bit of intimacy? Now, Yahweh. Again, Moses is on Mount Sinai. That's where he first heard Yahweh's name in Exodus 3.12, where Yahweh was, Moses was like, who do I say sent me? And Yahweh was saying, I am who I am, or I will be who I will be. But he said, Yahweh. Now it doesn't, okay, you will be who you will be, but it doesn't mean we understand the importance of your name, but now Moses knows God's personal name, which is Yahweh. Now, let's get to the Lord trans, uh, translation. The reason why we have that in your scriptures and you're reading your Bible is whenever you see Lord in all caps, in the Psalms, in the Old Testament, and even in the New Testament, it's referring to Yahweh. So, a couple hundred years before Jesus was born, in a time of exile and occupation, right, from the latter prophets into the New Testament writers, rabbinic tradition, they were afraid. They were like, man... What if we're taking the Lord's name in vain and that's why we're being occupied? So they switched it to Adonai. It wasn't to change scripture. It wasn't just to, they, were, they just wanted to consecrate his name as holy so much and not make a mistake that they completely just were like, we're going to say Elohim Adonai or Adonai Adonai or El Shaddai. They're, they were just replacing it with a name that they knew means Yahweh, but they didn't want to take his personal name in vain, which makes sense. I mean, you're in occupation, you read the Ten Commandments, but obviously that led to where we are today, where English translators did, I mean, they just kept Lord in all caps, and there's a whole Greek thing that could go into. We won't get into that today. But just know that whenever you see Lord in all caps in your Bible, it means Yahweh. And maybe it might be a good challenge for you to start reading it as his personal name than just the title. Now, Yahweh reveals his name through a narrative. The Bible is in context of a grand story. It's not that he just starts off in Genesis 1 and is like, Yahweh is here. Actually, we don't know his personal name or the meaning of his personal name until Exodus 34. That's a whole book and a half. Nearly two books into, into Holy Scripture. Then we actually know what his name means. That's important because his actions precede his name. And now I'm going to get into that heavy real quick but i want you guys to keep that in mind his actions what he has done precedes his explanation of his name and the explanation of his very character remember because he's not just explaining his name he's explaining his identity and his actual being yahweh the lord right we read yahweh yahweh god adonai that's the first phrase so we're gonna we're gonna really Comma by comma, piece this, you know, tear this apart. One of the commentaries I read labeled this as a pure act. We read in Genesis 1 that the Spirit was hovering over the waters. Yahweh alone is Yahweh alone. He is not a creature that has needs, that needs to sleep, that needs to eat. He has a hefty amount of incommunicable attributes, which basically means things that we can't have, things that we don't share in common with them, like his ability to know everything, his ability to be everywhere, his ability to tap into our thoughts at a moment's glass. Those are, his, those are just a very small sliver of his incommunicable attributes. But he's self-sustaining. There is no one like him. Yahweh the Lord, he is king. He's setting himself up as king of Israel, the best king they've ever had, and the king that they only ever should have had, if you ever read through the narrative of scripture. He was actually greatly saddened when they wanted a king like the nations. Because he set himself up as, hey, I'm, I'm the good king. But he is king still. And this is written, this is where the narrative context comes important. This is written in context of Exodus 32 and Exodus 9-10. through 10. Now 9-10 through 10 is the plagues on... Egypt, the 10 plagues. Now, most scholars and theologians would come to believe that each one of the plagues were attacking a certain deity, god or goddess of Egyptian uh, religion. 
Like, for example, the, like, I mean, honestly, killing of the, how, how do you say it? Killing of the, the cows and the, the fertile land and everything was an attack on their god of fertility. Basically saying the Nile, right? Nile was actually a god. Making it blood was an attack on it. Saying, no, no, no. This doesn't compare to me. I am Yahweh the Lord. This doesn't, this can't compare to me. And this is written right after, in Exodus 32, after, again, we were skipping a, a 20 chapters of Yahweh coming through for them. But then Israel made a golden calf and called it the God that led us out of um, the, the, the land of our affliction. Yahweh was like, no, I am Yahweh, Yahweh the Lord. I am not Yahweh. I am not the golden calf, the Lord. I am not Ra, the Lord. I am not Iris, the Lord. I am Yahweh, Yahweh, the Lord. He is different. He is far superior. And again, I want to bring back Exodus 3.14. That just says, I am who I am, or I will be who I will be. He is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Again, when Moses is hearing this, he knows what he's talking about. All throughout Genesis, Yahweh was this Yahweh. Always there for Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Let's go on to the next part. Yahweh, compassionate and merciful. Compassionate and merciful. Some translations might read graceful. I do prefer the merciful part. It seems a little more accurate to the Hebrew. One of the commentaries I read is that this is his very being. Right after he labeled his kingship, what does he follow it up with? Not his wrath. Not his anger. Not his rules but his compassion, that should, that should make us notice something. After his kingship, what is his kingship marked by? His compassion. It stems from his very goodness. And his mercy is divine. Now, what I was reading when preparing for this that really affected me is the reason why his mercy is divine is because he's creator God. He's creator Yahweh. He is the one that makes us, knows us, and can redeem us better than anything else. Better than anyone else. So his mercy isn't mercy like we get in the courts or in our laws today. That is kind of like a half-hearted mercy. You know, you kind of go and you're like, oh, we'll just let you go. But it doesn't mean you're fixed. You know, if you, you get like set free from your speeding ticket, that's mercy. But it's not divine mercy. Divine mercy is literally reanimating you to the point where you're not going to do that again. Because of his, in, in, like his perfect goodness. He's compassionate. We read through all, all throughout scripture in Psalms 108.3. And if you guys are wondering if he continues, yes, in Ephesians 2.4-5, he, he's also compassionate. And in Micah 7.19, again, he is compassionate. Please read these at your own leisure. And just bathe yourself in his compassion. He's compassionate to the lowly, to those who are destitute and poor and downtrodden. He's compassionate to those who are in mourning, right? We talked about lament last week. He has compassion for those of us who are lamenting, who are hurt, who are suffering. He joins alongside of us. Yahweh is a personal God. And all this is throughout scripture. Again, he had compassion on Abraham and Sarah and gave him a son. Moses is thinking about this. It's in narrative. Yahweh isn't just speaking his name out of thin air. He's done what he's done. He had compassion and mercy on Adam and Eve to not kill them for breaking the only rule he set up for them. And not only not just killing them, but... Oh, we'll get to that later. That's too good to get into right now. Yahweh, compassionate and merciful. Let's dive deeper into his character. Yahweh, slow to anger. Wow. We're still not at his wrath yet. In fact, it takes a while for him to be at his wrath. The Hebrew word for anger literally means to flare of the nostrils. Like you're angry. Like you're just going to hurt someone. But for him, it's slow. He has a holy patience. Um... Nahum 1.3 references this holy patience, references his long suffering and his reluctance to absolutely destroy us. That we deserve, you know, we're kind of, you know, it says in Romans, all have fallen short of the glory of God, right? 
I know I've made a mistake today. I know today I was quick to anger. I remembered a bad memory with someone in my past. And I was just like, I want to strike them down. But then I was, I was literally reading this today. And I was confronted with the fact that Yahweh, when dealing with me, isn't. I may get angry at somebody for literally only just cutting me off on the freeway. But Yahweh won't. He deals with Israel and us in compassion. Again, in Exodus 32, 1 through 6, we have the golden calf. Now, yes, 3,000 people did die. But Yahweh was so slow to anger that he didn't wipe out the entire nation of Israel. That's huge. I want to I want to I want to mind you how important it was. So let's I'm just going to read you a few of um, right before uh, uh, Exodus 20 in Exodus 14. We have the pursuit of Pharaoh, which is the Red Sea, right? Israelites complained and grumbled. We are going to die out here by Pharaoh. Yahweh opened him up for him, right? I don't know, like, why, why, are we, why does he mention this? Just, just, just real quick. Exodus 15 was a song of Moses and Israel. They're happy. But then Exodus 16, the Lord provides manna. They were grumbling in a desert. They thought they're going to die. Lord provided manna. But then they thought they're going to be thirsty and they grumbled again and complained. But then the Lord didn't smite them or get angry. He put water in a rock in Exodus 17. Then they were attacked by their enemies, Amalek. Still, Yahweh did not reject them in, in anger. He provided victory and a miracle. Then Moses didn't know really what to do, and Yahweh wasn't angry at Moses. He provided Jethro to give him advice. And there were other points in Right before we get to that, where Yahweh came up and showed up for them. The ten plagues. And then, again, you got to think about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and how he was just there for them. And how often they messed up. And the Israelites were like, oh, we're going to make a golden calf. And say that this was our God that led us out of... Wouldn't you be angry? If you were there for somebody 24-7, bailing them out loving on them, even when it was their own stupid fault. And instead of, and, and it's not like they just gave credit to somebody else. They made up an imaginary friend and gave credit to them, right? So just think about like, you know, like a little pretend spirit. It doesn't even exist. They made it. And said, okay, this is our God now. Because they got lazy. It was all about laziness. They couldn't even wait three days for Moses to be on Mount Sinai. But he is slow to anger. A good quote I got was, Wrath walks, mercy runs. He is merciful and compassionate. Right there. Boom. But he is slow to anger. I want you guys to think about Luke 15, about the prodigal son. How the father saw the son from a far way off and he ran to him and threw his arms over him. His wrath walks. His mercy is almost an instant. It runs. R.C. Sproul said this, in terms of our current state, how long did God endure your unbelief before you were redeemed? If not for the long suffering of God, we would all perish. Our very salvation is an example of his long suffering. But that's not all. Oh, wrong way. Yahweh, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Wow. Again, you could bring up Luke 15. Abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. The father was faithful to the son when the son wasn't. Hesed is right there for love. Hesed. That's the Hebrew word for love. That's a whole word study on its own. But I just want to give three definitions real quick. It could mean covenant loyalty. Unfailing love or steadfast love? Covenant loyalty is on top for a reason. And there's a reason why I put a picture of stars. I'm not sure if you guys can see it behind right now. Or you guys could just walk outside and look at the stars too. Please don't. Um, I'm speaking. But he has abounding and steadfast love and faithfulness. Moses knows what this means. It's a call back to the covenants. Remember when the Spirit of the Lord walked 
like a fire through the offering that Abraham has set up. But Abraham never did anything. The Abrahamic covenant. Right below Moses is three million Israelites. A man that was once mocked and shamed for only having one son has three million descendants at this point when God is bringing up his covenantal love, his faithfulness. He does not bail when times get hard. He does not leave you when you make a mistake. His love is steadfast because it's bound in his covenants and he is keeping his covenant. He told Israel, Jacob, that he will save his people out from the land of Egypt, that he will bring them out. And where is Moses at right now? Mount Sinai, after seeing some miracles he has never seen before. I mean, he is just so loving to an obstinate people that it's insane. Psalms 89, Romans 8, 5, Lamentations, Lamentations, when I, I just read this the other day and it honestly made me cry. In Lamentations, Jeremiah is weeping over the brokenness of the fact that Israel had rejected again the Lord and now the Lord is punishing them, rightly. Again, slow to anger. Took a long time to get them there. But then Jeremiah, I would, I, I just, I'll actually just read it right now. It's so good. And Jeremiah just goes in, in chapter 3, verses 21 to 23, and he says, I recall this to my mind, therefore I wait. The Lord's acts of Yahweh's, my bad, again, Yahweh's acts of mercy indeed do not end, for his compassions do not fail. For they are new every morning, great is your faithfulness. In the midst of absolute suffering, in the middle of lamenting, Yahweh is still abounding in steadfast love and his compassions never end. But the writers of Moses, the writer of this, was not satisfied and Yahweh wasn't satisfied. Yahweh just didn't say abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness of himself. He said, keeping steadfast love for the thousands. The Hebrew way of saying this is really important. This is the crux. This is the main idea Yahweh is trying to get to you. He is steadfast love for the thousands. I know we kind of read that, you know, he will revisit the iniquity to the third and fourth generation, but some translations say for the thousands of generations. To the thousands. He is keeping it to the thousands. It is so much more than the third and fourth generations for his wrath. His steadfast love is going out. And again, just think of creation in general and how we just all benefit from it his steadfast love is shown through everything all the goodness he's so intimate he is so near he's just not sometimes said fast or occasionally he is always fulfilling his covenant promise with us all the time and it's important it's important that we note this to the thousands. Yahweh, forgiving iniquity and your transgression of sin, or some other translations, forgiving iniquity, transgression, and sin, and some really brutal ones, forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and uh, degeneracy. This is after Exodus 32. This is after the golden calf. This is after Abraham lied about Sarah being his sister, instead of the reality of her being his wife. This is after Jacob cheated Esau out of the birthright. This is after Adam and Eve should have been kicked out of the Garden of Eden and put to death for their transgression and sin. Yahweh isn't just saying this. He is this. He's not just saying, I'm forgiving. No, he has been. He continually is. Forgiving, the Hebrew word forgiving is nasa. It means lift up or carry away. I want you to get in mind the cross for us as uh, for, our, for our modern eyes. Yeshua, which is the Hebrew name for Jesus, which means 
Yahweh saves. That's a whole nother sermon. Yahweh saves. Yeshua. Jesus. He literally carried the cross all the way down to Calvary. Carrying it away from you and I. My brothers and sisters, Yahweh is intimate and he is forgiving. Ing is continual. It's his nature. He just doesn't forgive when he wants to forgive. He's forgiving. It's his, it's his nature to forgive you and I. We are covenant bound by the blood of Christ. It's in his nature to look at you and not look at your sin. It's in his nature. It's, it's why David could write Psalm 51, blot out my transgressions. Forget my sin. Why? Because David knew Yahweh would. Because that's what he does. Numbers 14, 18 and Psalm 79, 8 also reference the fact that he forgives our iniquities. That he will not look. The sea of forgetfulness we get in the New Testament. Our sins were red, but he washed us white as snow. What we had were dirty rags, but he renewed us. He is forgiving. He is compassionate. He is slow to anger. He is abounding in steadfast love. He is abounding in steadfast love for the thousands. And he is forgiving. There is nothing you as a covenant brother or sister can do to have him not be able to forgive you. It is his very nature. That is what he does. This is his character. And we see it all throughout the narrative of the Old Testament. We see it continuing on through First and Second Kings and Chronicles and the prophets. And we see it through our Savior, Yeshua. Yahweh saves. But Yahweh, yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished, inflicting the punishment of the fathers on the children and on the grandchildren to the fourth and to the third and fourth generations. This is arguably the hardest part that most commentaries realize. C.S. Lewis even has his own slight issue with this when it comes to it. It seems so opposite from what we were just front-loaded with. Compassionate loving, but now he's punishing? His justice is good. This is good. This is for the non-covenant members. It is a righteous wrath. It is beautiful. It is holy. Again, it's slow to anger. It doesn't come in an instant. It does not. <clears throat> I mean, think about <clears throat> the end times. <clears throat> slow to anger. He's building it. It's important to note that not everyone wants to be saved or forgiven. Think about the New Testament. Jesus literally asks, do you wish to be healed? He says in scripture, he knocks on the door. In Exodus, you had a choice to put the lamb's blood over your doorpost. You had a choice. Some Israelites just didn't. It is a tough and painful reality for us to swallow, but it is a, and yet joyful, simply because, simply because, the suffering and wrongdoing that we face and feel from the world will not go unpunished. He will have his final say with it. And when it comes to this third and fourth generations, most writers read it as a trickle down of consequences, a trickle down effect. If a divorce happens in a family, the child will suffer. Not necessarily because it's the child's fault and God's punishing the child, but because that's just the way the world is structured. It will visit right? The grandchildren to the third and fourth generations, they will feel it. They'll feel the pains. I still feel the pains of my grandparents' sin and the way that the sin still impacts and inflicts me. It's a sad reality, but the more beautiful reality is the fact that we have a, a Yahweh who's compassionate, slow to anger, loving, loving to the thousands, forgiving, and once the time runs out, his righteous wrath will come because he is just. Now, before I, we're going to be going to questions right now, but I just want to say something real quick. 
It is really important, I stress to you guys, the importance of narrative, any actions before the name. Yahweh wants to be personal. That Exodus 34 is right after Moses heard this, he fell down to his face. Exodus 33, it's important to know, Exodus 33, Moses wanted to know, Moses wanted to see God's glory. And Yahweh said, I'll do one better for you. I will tell you my name. The name of Yahweh is literally his glory on earth. It is holy. And there's a reason why people are afraid to say it. There's a reason why the rabbis were concerned. But I want to entreat and invite you guys. Be personal with him. He's just not the Lord. He's just not God. Those are all correct titles. He's not just Father. He does reveal himself as Father. He is our Father. We can cry out, Abba, Father, Dad, God. But the first way he revealed himself and the way he talked about himself was Yahweh. He is personal. He has, God has a name. And it's beautiful. And it saves.